Praise the Lord. And a good morning to all of you this morning. This morning. And, and we want to thank God for His mercies upon our lives that we are back in His presence uh, one more Friday, not just to worship Him, but to take part in His body and in His blood that we may know and understand that we are part of Him, one with Him. This is a great privilege God has given to us and uh, we cannot take it lightly. It's a very important uh, ordinance Jesus has given to us so that we will understand the great love that He has poured upon our lives and continuously we will know that we are not belonging to ourselves anymore, but we do belong to God who gave himself for us and who died for us on the cross and made us his very position and sons and daughters. Thereby, he's also giving us the privilege to have inheritance with Jesus in his all that he possesses on earth and later on in the eternal life. And this is a great love of God. Praise be to God. And we will go to a word quickly. And the word, the title for today's message is the principles of redemption. The subject that I have taken, I mean, I wanted to bring it to you, uh, is with a purpose. Uh, many of us uh, sometimes or many times live a life which is not victorious. We see things that we are lacking. We say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack, but we live with lack. Either uh, lack of finances, lack of health, lack of joy, lack, lack of peace, or lack of many things that we feel that we are feeling insufficient. Uh, there are reasons for it. And God is not that, that he doesn't want to give anything to us. Everything he has created, he kept it for us. It is for us to have, for us to live with it and show that he is a God who gives to his children. But sometimes we do not know some important principles that are involved in getting these things for us. Uh, I always make this statement, salvation is free. But when it comes to promises and other blessings, there are uh, things that you need to do to get them. Amen. So the principles of redemption is uh, because we already proclaimed to you the promise for this year, the year of divine protection and restoration. We have been list speaking to it and you have been talking about probably some of you are every day meditating upon this and you are waiting to see something happening in, the, in your lives. Protection, as far as protection is concerned, it, can be, it, it is protection every day. If you are alive today, you are protected. If you are in good health today, you are protected. If you are uh, breathing today, you are already protected. So the promise is being fulfilled in everyone's life, those who are hearing me today. Amen. And there also restoration. When it comes to restoration, we're talking about restoring something that you have lost, you have you know, foregone because of the situations whatsoever, and God will restore. So however, these promises in general, it's very important for us to know we need to redeem the promises. It's very important. Promises does not become yours until you understand the promise itself and then you understand the direction given to us and to put yourself in the place to receive the promises. When it comes to redemption, I like to give you this example. We get some gift watchers from friends and so on, or gift cards, or sometimes some of these uh, uh, shops, they give you gift watchers or coupons to redeem some uh, certain amount of money when you, on your next purchase and so on. However, all these coupons or all these gift watchers and cards, generally, uh, they carry some rules and regulations to it. Sometimes some of those watchers are absolutely useless because the conditions are so strong and so strong. Like, like, for example, they tell you, give you 100 dirhams of gift voucher or a coupon uh, to collect. And they say, this is valid only when you do a purchase for 500 dirhams. The company already makes a much bigger profit on that 500 dirhams. For them to give this 100 dirhams is nothing. So similarly to uh, receive something. And also another thing that happens is that to get those, that uh, to redeem. For example, it's a gift card that you want to redeem. Still, you have the card with you. That's probably it's in your pocket, in your purse, wherever it is. But then to redeem it, you have to do something. 
The one thing that you minimum you have to do is where you have to know where to redeem it. And then you have to go to the place and present the card and probably some credentials so that you will be able to redeem that gift card, its worth or its value or so whatsoever. Similarly, we have the promises of God. And promises of God are given with a purpose which is clearly mentioned. My first scripture comes in here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 onwards. This scripture, I've preached on it uh, many times. Uh, many times I talk about it. And uh, it's, it's an important thing. The reason is it clearly talks the importance of the promises that have been given to us by God in his scriptures. It says, his divine power has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. His power is already given through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. How you get everything? Through the knowledge of him. So you need to have knowledge of him through whom we got it. That's knowledge of Jesus Christ. What he is, who he is, what he did, how he does things, what his greatness is. This knowledge you need to have because he's given to us through glory and virtue, verse 4, by which also, by which have been given to us, by which means also glory and virtue, uh, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Peter calls it exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world, through, in the world, through lust. Two things happen with the promises. You partake in the divine nature. I mean all that God can do. That all that God is. Well the attributes of God can become yours. When you apply these promises. When you understand these promises. When you receive these promises with faith. And you begin to put into practice things that you need to uh, put into practice to redeem these promises. You become, you'll take part in the divine nature. And also we escape the corruption in this world. All kinds of sin. Which is because of the lust of the flesh. And all those things <clears throat> you'll be able to conquer by these promises. That knowing that you are not less left alone on earth to face everything and suffer those things. Not that, not so. But you have been given promises through these promises. You know that you have the power to overcome. You have the power to set yourself free. When you get bound with some things in this world, you will be free through these promises when you apply them to your life. Hallelujah. When you're talking about protection, you need to do something protection because the word of God says the evil one. The devil is roaming like a roaring lion whom he may devour all the time at every place. He's waiting to devour you. Means you have to apply this promise of protection so that he will not devour you. He will not enter your home. He will not enter your life to take your joy, to take your peace. So it's important to know the promise and to apply it to your life. Amen. Hallelujah. But the promises must be redeemed. The promises must be understood. You know, the principles to be, to be used. There are lots of principles in the word of God. Unless you put them into practice, those things cannot be yours. And certain things happen to you and to me because the principles are already laid up and those things will happen. For example, the rain comes. It's God's principle to send rain on good and bad people together at the same time. The sun shines on the good and bad people at the same time. That's a principle. And the rain comes on a certain time, on a certain season. That's a principle, brothers and sisters. Those principles cannot be changed. And lots of other principles that tell us, you do this, this is what is going to happen. You eat this, this is what is going to happen. If you don't do this, this is what is going to happen. It happens to both the Gentiles and the children of God. Those sinners and non-sinners all together, those principles do not change. It's very important. So I will take you through some of the principles just for you to understand how God established them. The first one I'll take you is to redempt, redemption of the firstborn. And I want you to understand, take to the scripture, you know, for the Jewish people, the Israelites, every firstborn thing belongs to God. It's a straightforward principle. There's nothing. You can do nothing about it. The moment uh, a, a woman gives a birth and that too got to a male child and it becomes God's and 
there are some principles to redeem it, redeem the child. Similarly, all the animals that a man, a Jewish man, Israelite man, possesses, and when gives birth, and if it's a male, happens to be male, that automatically belongs to God. And it needs to be redeemed, or it must be sacrificed to God. It belongs to simply God. Let me take you through the scripture. Exodus chapter 13, verse 11 onwards. Book of Exodus chapter 13, verse 11. And it said, it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of Canaanites as he swore to you and to your fathers and give it to give it to you. Verse 12, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that opens the womb, all that opens, everything has to be set apart. And that is every firstborn that comes from an, an animal which you have. The males shall be the Lord's. That's it. One word. This is the principle God has put, whether it's in the Old Testament, New Testament, it's the same thing. It doesn't change. This belongs to God. Verse 13, but every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Now there are animals that are not kosher or not holy. What happens? You have to redeem. A donkey cannot be given as a sacrifice to the Lord, but you cannot let it live. The word says, let me read the rest of it. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. In other words, you have to kill it. You cannot use that donkey for any purpose. And all the firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. What he says when a donkey is born, if it happens to be a male, you have to take a lamb from the flock and bring it and offer in the place of the donkey to the Lord. It must be sacrificed, the lamb. So the lamb is instead of the donkey. In the place of donkey, the donkey to be redeemed, a lamb had to die. If that lamb does not die, this donkey must die. I just was meditating upon this, you know, this word this morning, even this is not my subject. Let me tell you, we were like those donkeys, all of us, all the Gentiles. Jesus redeemed us by dying on the cross. Amen. He took our death on the cross. He redeemed us with his blood. So we were like the unkosher, unwanted Gentiles uh, to be. But God, in his mercy and grace, he sacrificed his own son. Now the principle, I want you to understand, God does not break his own principles. God is righteous at all times. God does things which is only right and anything that is unrighteous cannot happen with him. Because he's righteous, because he knew to redeem us, Unless something dies, he cannot redeem us. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, for us. Hallelujah. What it says again in this verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 13. And all the firstborn of man among your sons shall be redeemed. Means you don't want to sacrifice them. You don't want to kill them. Therefore, they must be redeemed. Verse 14. So it shall be when you son asks in the... Time to come, saying, what is this that you shall say to him? By strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of the bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of the beast. Therefore... I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. You need to make, understand your children, the principles God has laid out. Brothers and sisters, families, fathers and mothers, what I want to tell you is your children must understand the principles of redemption, also the principles of why we are saved, why we worship God, who is Jesus all about. Oh, from the time they are very young, they must understand who is Jesus, why Jesus died on the cross. What did he do? You must teach your children. That's what God is telling in the scripture. Your sons, you tell them. Because on that day, when the firstborn in Egypt was put to death, killed in the night when the angel of death and begin to kill, that day in the, all the land, every firstborn should have died. However, because of the day of the Passover, lamb was killed for each family, each Jewish family. Because of that, their firstborn were spared. Otherwise, they would have been also killed. The blood that was applied on the door protected their children. So they will be reminded, this is how God dealt in those days. 
and verse 16. And it shall be a sign on your hand as a frontlets between your eyes. By, for by strength of the land, uh, hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt. What God wanted them to know is God redeemed them out of Egypt. Today, we have taken part in the bread and the blood or, or the, 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 uh, the flesh and the blood, uh, blood of Lord Jesus Christ. What he wants us to remember always, he redeemed us from the rest of the Gentiles in the world to be a special people unto him, a holy nation. A royal priesthood, a special people, so that God's eyes will be upon us at all times. This is what, you know, the principles. It's exactly the same thing. What they have been taught, we have been taught also. So understand today, for a, for a son or an animal that needs to live in those days, something, they must be redeemed. If they have to live. If they are not redeemed, they must be killed or sacrificed to the Lord. One of the best examples, let us take this example did not come or this redeeming system did not come after these people went into bondage to Egypt. It has come, it has been established much before that 400 years before this thing happened. That is, we'll find book of Genesis chapter 22. The story of Abraham giving his son Isaac as a, a, a sacrifice. And God tells him, go bring your son. Give him as a sacrifice. And Abraham did not deny. Did not say no. The time he took his son and all those sacrificing material with him. When he began his journey towards Mount, Hor Mount Horeb. Uh, he, he, he already, what he did is, he given his son to God. When he set up himself on journey, he's already sacked, gave his son to God. Then he reaches Mount Horeb. Then there he organizes the altar. And there he puts everything ready. And then he binds his son, puts him on the altar, and he takes out his knife just to, you know, slaughter his own son. And when God says, Genesis chapter 22, verse 11, it says, But the angel of the Lord, now angel is capital A, angel of the Lord means God himself. Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. This word in Hebrew is hineni. Here I am to do anything, everything with my whole self. I am here in your presence, Lord. That's what exactly it means. Verse 12, it says, then he said, do not lay your hand on the lad. Or do... Anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son. Your only son from me. And verse 13 is important. Give a note. He just said this word. Abraham was probably bending and shivering. Hearing the voice of the Lord. Then he just lifts his eyes up. This says. Then Abraham lifted his eyes. And looked. And there behind him. Just behind, I don't know why he looked back. The God was inspiring him to look. Behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now I want you to understand this principle. Anything that you offer to God, dedicate to God, it belong, belongs to God. I want to take this note in your hearts, brothers and sisters. Anytime you vow to God anything, Bees, be careful. The moment, the day you said, Lord, this I give to you, that belongs to him. That belongs to him. You cannot do anything about it. You have to give it to him. If you want me to really go deeper into it, there are certain rules and regulations. I, I, I let me not go there. Say, if anything has to be redeemed, there is a penalty to be paid. What it says is, fifth of the value should be added to what you want. For example, you work to God, you give a, th a thousand dirhams, you know, on, on so and so time, I'll bring thousand dirhams, give as a special offering, your word to God. And then you don't want to give it. Actually, you don't not only give it, but you have to, the thought even comes, you have to add one-fifth of that value. If not a dirham, let's say a gold or something like that. You have to add one-fifth of the value and pay that and take that back. I'm told, told you about uh, dirham, uh, money, but if, suppose it's a, a thing. Let's just say I will give you uh, one, uh, 10 grams of gold. So you did not, you are already given, but you want to take it back. You still have to pay additionally one-fifth 
let's say if it's cost 1,000, you pay 1,200 and you take it back. That strict are the rules. Now here, when Abraham has given his son, it becomes God's. Now God, he has to be redeemed also. Isaac cannot be taken freely from this place home. Something has to be offered. So God established a principle. God knew that has to be redeemed. He sent a ram all the way onto the top of the hill, the Mount Horeb. Horeb. And then Abraham could offer that, redeem his son Isaac and take him. Hallelujah. Hope you're all getting understanding the principle. So this is exactly, we were redeemed from eternal death by Jesus Christ, which I already mentioned to you. Because Jesus actually died in our place. The ram died in the place of uh, Isaac. So, there's one more example I wanted to give you quickly. Some of you must be wondering why God has taken Levites to be his special position. There are some scriptures that are so clear about it. Uh, book of Numbers chapter 3, just hold there. Book of Numbers chapter 3 talks about God has taken the whole Levite clan or the tribe for one reason. To redeem the rest of the 11 tribes, their firstborns who had not been redeemed in the last 40 years. I mean, when they were actually traveling. So God wanted to put, or, or, or the time when he told this, not 40 years, when he told, because there were people who had not been redeemed and they must be redeemed. In order to redeem, God said, I will take the Levites and they become my servants. They become my possession and so the rest of the people can go free. Let's read this scripture. Uh, Numbers chapter 3 verse 40. Then the Lord said to Moses, Number all the firstborn males of the children of Israel from a month old and above. And take the number of their names. Verse 41. You shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord instead of all the firstborn. Did you get this? Is it clear to you? You said, you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord. Because I am the Lord, I am, my principles are true. Nothing changes. That's what he, whenever he says, I am the Lord, this is how I am. That's what he's saying. Instead of all the firstborn among the children of year, and, and, all, and the livestock of the Levites, instead of all the firstborn among the livestock of the children of Israel. So all that Levites were, all that belonged to them was belonging to God. They became a personal possession of God from that time onwards to redeem all the firstborn that were there at the time. Later on, we can see the number uh, was about 22,000 firstborn, 20,000 plus. And then actually the number of Levites was not sufficient to cover, so there are few uh, children were left unredeemed, and we'll learn it later on. I'll show you what God did for those two uh, left out people. I'll take you there. So therefore, God redeemed the principles of God, the redemption are extremely strict, and they are principles of God. And then, therefore, if it is so, this calls our attention to understand how to redeem what we need to get from God, or even the promises. Amen? So let's consider the promise of this year. As I already mentioned to you, you have two promises in this one uh, statement that we made, that year 2021 is the year of divine protection and redemption. I will probably only speak about protection today uh, based on the time, because let us understand how to protect ourselves. And I will take you through a scripture that speaks clearly how David protected the whole nation of Israel through applying uh, the similar uh, uh, principle of redemption. So I want to take you to the book of First Chronicles chapter 21. Just hold on there. Let me tell you this story, the whole story, what happened. One day when David was doing very well, everything settled, the country is peaceful, all is good. Suddenly the devil, it's the word of God says in the beginning of this chapter 21, uh, First Chronicles, the devil put this thought in David to count or to take a census all the people of Israel. The whole idea why you want to take census was just, you know, I, I, I imagine like this. David was there and calls Joab the, the commander-in-chief. Uh, how much is our army? 
Uh, he would have told maybe uh, 100,000, 500,000. Oh, 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 are you sure? Only this much. I think we have more. No, no, uh, maybe, maybe 600, 700. Don't you know how many are there? Uh, uh, not exactly Lord or whatsoever, the king. Then he said, I want you to go and count how much is our army. Then Joab said to him, why are you worried? We've got victory in every, every battle that we went. Why do you want to count? We are fine. We don't have to really count. God bless you. God given you us everything that we need. But the devil put this thought to destroy Israel at that time. That's what the word says in the beginning of this verse, this chapter. And because David pressurized, Joab goes and counts it. And they had in those days the army, uh, the the. Israel alone was about 100, 1 million, 100,000, 1 million and 100,000. And over that, the Jewish people, the clan or the tribe of Jew, Jewish people were 400,000 army. In other words, David had a powerful army in those days for, for himself. If you see around the world, the highest army uh, the China has got next to it is India. We have about one point, some three or some kind of million army that we have. But in those days, for that small country, the number of army that they had was big. So David felt, oh, great, wonderful. Suddenly, the Lord struck the nation Israel. And he began to understand. And God struck, I don't know what happened and what was the manifestation of the strike, striking of God. And David understood it was his fault. Immediately began to repent. And God sends prophet Gad to him. You have done a mistake. And I mean, David himself started, I made a mistake. And prophet comes and tells, I give him three options. That he will have famine for three years in this country. Or he has to run away from his enemies for three months. Or three days of plague in this country. David, because, oh, I'm in a, such difficult situation. It's better for me to fall in the hands of the Lord. Rather than falling into the enemy's hand. Because the Lord is merciful. He understood. David's principle is very, very important. He knew God as merciful. He said, he's merciful. I'll fall in his hands. The first day. 70,000 Israelites were killed in Jerusalem. 70,000 in one day. And when 70,000 70, were dead, before anything David said, God himself felt so bad. If the word says he relented looking at the deaths in Israel. So Yasta commands the angel that was slaying people, stop. Now angel was standing in one place. It says he was in between the heaven and the earth. Probably he was in the air. And angel stood where? In a place called Onan's threshing field or Aravna. As both names are written in the Bible. Onan or Aravna. His threshing field is standing there. And as he's standing there, when, when, uh, when uh, David saw him, he repents and cries out to the Lord. And he says these words. First Chronicles chapter 21 verse 17. And the David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. Now brothers and sisters, these kind of words need to be taken very serious. Whenever David confessed his sin, he confessed it fully, <coughs> openly, without hiding anything. He says, it's me. It's my fault, O oh Lord. I have committed the sin. And some people, some of us, when we pray, commit and trying to go confess our sins, we try to cover up it. Lord, if I've done anything, Lord, anything I've made, if by any mistake I've done, forgive me. No, no. Your sins which are known to you, you, you mention them to God. You prescribe Clearly say to him what you have done and ask for forgiveness. That's how David did. If you read Psalm 51, how he has confessed his sin that he committed with Bathsheba very clearly shows he was open man. He did not hide anything. He not only just uh, confessed to God, he wrote that Psalm 51 and made it public to him everything that, that he was a sinner. Okay, let me continue here. What he says, I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, uh, I pray, O oh Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that 
they should be plagued. You know what it means? David already offered himself as a sacrifice to redeem the people of Israel. When he said, take me and my family, David and his whole family becomes gods and God actually can destroy them. God can destroy them. But God in his mercy, what God said, he is merciful. God began to show mercy. What he says, tells prophet Gad, go tell him, take oxen and go to the threshing field of Onan and erect an altar and let him offer offerings to me to stop this plague from here onwards. Then means, in other words, God wanted to spare David and his family because he confessed his sin. And not only confessed his sin, he was willing to sacrifice himself for the redemption of the whole nation. And God loved it. God wanted to save him. So in that time, David goes to Onan's threshing field and Onan and his sons were there. Actually, he had four sons. They saw the angels standing between heaven, the, the, the heaven and the earth. They all went and rushed and fled and they were afraid to look at him. And, but Onan continued to do his work when he saw King David coming to him, came running to him and bowed before him. And he said, King, you have come here. What can I do for you? I'm here to do anything that you command me to do, O oh, king. Let's just command me. And then David, see what David said to Onan. Chapter, uh, sorry, 1 Chronicles 21, 22. 21, 22. Then David said to Onan, grant me the place, grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me, at the full price. You know what he's telling? Because I'm king, maybe you want to reduce price and give. You just want to show me uh, that you, your respect to me. Don't do the take full price. That the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Verse 23. But Onan said to David, take it to yourself. And let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also give you the oxen that are for the burnt offerings and the threshing implements, all the equipment, the wooden equipment for wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. I want to give, Lord, I got this opportunity to give it to the king. He wanted to take advantage of the situation to offer to the king so that you have favor with him. But then, verse 24, King David said to Onan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. You know what is full price means? Any of you have a land, you will have a value to it. And when you want to sell it, you will have a particular price to it. That is what is full price. And people come and negotiate with you to reduce it. If you are reduced, it's not the full price. You have actually reduced the price. Or you will try to get the full price by saying a more price. And then in negotiation, you will reach to the full price. Now here, David made it clear. I want whatever you thought the price for this. I want to give it all to you. Then see what further he says. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord. I can't take somebody else's, somebody else's and thing to offer to the Lord. I cannot do that. Nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. You know what he's telling is there's a principle. When you give an offering to the Lord, it must pain you. Brothers and sisters, if you have a lot of money and you have brought a certain amount, some person who does not have so much yet brings the same amount. That's the reason Jesus made it very clear. The woman with two mites came and gave those two mites everything that she has. He said, this is the woman gave the maximum. It may be just two mites. So what he's telling, that does not cost you, cannot give to God. There's a principle there. Verse 25, so David gave Onan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place, which is an ex excellent price, great price to the, to, for that land. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord and he answered him in, uh, from heaven by fire uh, on the altar of the burnt offering. So Lord commanded the angel and he returned 
his sword into his sheath. The moment the offering was given, the Lord commanded to put his sword back in. Means actually the Lord came by fire. You know, there are a few, a few examples when Lord came by fire and took the, uh, uh, the offerings pe- made, made by people. We know uh, Elijah, when he offered, the fire came. Not only at the time of Elijah, Samson's uh, parents, Manoah uh, and his wife, they offered the offering to him. God came by fire and took it. Also Gideon's offering, he took it by fire. And also the, when the, the temple, Solomon dedicated the temple, the offering God came and took by fire. These are the real manifestations of our God. And after taking the offerings, in other words, the principle of redemption was totally applied to redeem the whole nation of Israel at the time. And David himself and the family. Hallelujah. So sacrifice. So sacrifice is what is redemption is all about. What is the meaning of sacrifice? If you go to the dictionaries like uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary will talk about sacrificing an animal to a deity or to God and so on. But Cambridge uh, dictionary says like this, to give up something that is valuable. Sacrifice means to give up something that is valuable to you. It's very valuable to you. In order to help another person. That's what is sacrifice. You have plenty. And out of that you give a little. That's not called a sacrifice. If you have plenty and help somebody. That's not sacrifice. You just help somebody. Sacrifice is what will redeem things for you. Do you get me brothers and sisters? Some of you can say yes who are sitting here. Sacrifice is what will redeem things for you. Sacrifice is what will redeem your promise for you. Hallelujah. About when it comes to sacrifice, we talk about this woman who came, broke the alabaster box of uh, ointment for Jesus and anointed him, poured on his head. That's called sacrifice. She redeemed her life from eternal death. That's what is sacrifice. And, And then furthermore, so... At the end, sacrifice means it should cost you, really, it should cost you something. That's what is very, very important when it comes to, uh, cost means it costs you money. It should cost you gold or silver, something it costs you. You know, Bible talks about, you know, exchanging the sacrifice money. There are sometimes you need to exchange it for money instead of, for example, you have to give, offer a, a goat or, or a lamb, but you cannot take it. Then you have to take the money for it and offer. Let's see, book of Numbers, book of Numbers chapter 3, verse 46. Uh, the same example that I, which we read a few minutes ago, how God has taken the Levites. Now, the, I said Two, over 270 people, I think approximately 273 people were not redeemed. Because there were not enough number of Levites. There were only such a such number and 273 Israelites were left without being redeemed. See what God said to him. And for the redemption of the 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel... Numbers 346, that's what I'm reading. We are more than the number of the Levites, who are more than the number of Levites. Verse 47, you shall take five shekels for each one individually. Pay money, five shekels. You shall take them in the currency, means money. It's, it's actually like money in currency of the shekels of the sanctuary, the shekel of the 20 geras. And verse 48, you shall give the money with which the excess number of them redeemed to Aaron and his sons. Hallelujah. It goes to the priest and his sons. The excess money. Because those who were not redeemed by one one person Five shekels was a little less money. Later on, we'll find there are scriptures, uh, the value of Israelite man and woman of certain age. Uh, it's written in the Bible. It's not where I don't, want, I don't want to take you there. There's one more example that we'll find exchanging it for money is about tithing. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, about tithing. Deuteronomy uh, I'm not going to talking about tithing now, but some exchange only I'm talking here. I'm not going to talk about tithe, but maybe next time I need to talk about tithing to its very important, serious principle to redeem what you have. And you shall truly 
Deuteronomy 14, 22. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. Truly you must tithe. That's what it says. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses. Then what he says, I don't want to read the whole chapter here. And verse 25 says, verse 25 it says, You shall exchange it when you cannot carry your all livestock or your grains. Maybe you're staying 200 kilometers away. You don't know how to carry it. What he says, you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go and to the place which the Lord your God has chosen. That is Jerusalem. Means bring money. Exchange your goods for money and bring it. In other words, it makes it very clear about how one should bring offerings to the Lord. Now, for the protection of all Israel, David offered himself first. That's how the protection came. Then instead of David, God told him to offer oxen. And also, it, that specific place, so David had to purchase it for 600 shekels of gold. And that's a price. He got protection for the whole nation and himself. So for your protection and for my protection, we need to bring and give something to the Lord. What is that you and I can give? It begins with this, brothers and sisters. It is sacrifices also take us to the sacrifice of praise and worship. And that's that. Oh, you may be, okay, it's not money. As far as it's not money, it's okay. There's some of you thinking. Let's go. It's not just sacrifice of praise and worship and giving. Let me take you through another two scriptures. We are very close to closing it now. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 11. Sacrifice of praise here. Let's, let's see this. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And the voice of those who will say, all these people will say, what they will say. Praise the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good. That's how they worship. For his mercy endures forever. And those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. So you shall offer sacrifice of praise all the time. You shall offer the sacrifice of praise at every instance in your homes, in your, at your places, every single day. In other words, what it says here is that... You got a promise. You will take up your promise. You will look at the promise. Somebody can quickly get me this one of the sheet of the promise. Here is there. Somewhere here or here, there. Yeah, yeah quickly. Just get this is mad. Thank you. No one appear before. You'll hold your promise. You'll look into the promise. If you're hanging it on the wall, it says, the word says, do not be afraid, Abraham. Abraham, I'm your shield. Your exceedingly great reward. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. You are my exceedingly great reward. Praise you for this promise. Then he'll say, year 2021, the year of divine protection and restoration. Lord, what a promise. You are my protection. You are my shield. You are my, you're going to restore everything to me. I thank you. You'll begin to praise him for the promise that you have. And Lord, thank you for the direction that you've given. So I will restore to you, you, the, the ears, everything that are lost. And you, you can read the whole scripture for that matter. And the direction, every word of God is pure. He's a shield to those who put their trust in him. Lord, I want to put my trust in you. Every single day. Because your promise is truth. And I will take this promise seriously in my life. And I praise you. I mean this is how you will redeem your promise. That here we get testimonies at the end of the year. Some people come and say Except this year was exactly what the Lord gave the promise. Everything happened to me. And some it happened to him. Not to me. 
Yes, all these kind of people are in our church. Oh, it happened to him. Why did it not happen to me? This is how some of us talk and some of us are so excited. Because some of you, I thank God, you take the promise so seriously and you receive it. It's not because this promise was given in this year at this time. I want you to take every single promise of God, which is written in the word of God. When you find a promise, hold on to it. Talk about it. Tell God, you said this in your words, Lord. I thank you for this promise. Begin to praise him and worship. This is what he says here. For the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. But that's a promise. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause the captives of the land to return at the first, says the Lord. When you do this, I'll bring the captives free. I'll set the captives free. This is how you redeem your promises. There's one more verse. Psalm 54. Psalm 54, verse 6. Psalm 54, verse 6. I will freely sacrifice to you, the psalmist says. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. Sacrifice of praise. That's one thing. And then second thing, your giving of offerings. Brothers and sisters, let me tell this story before I close. This has happened. I told this. I want to say it again. This is a testimony of a sister who is from our church, an African sister. And she comes to this church, and then she was laid off for, I think, seven months or so. She did not have a job. She had a hard time meeting her needs during this time. Only thing that she had from the company where she worked, she was to work for this hotel, this Burj Al Arab, just the accommodation. And she needed to eat her food. And I know by her saying she had no money to even eat food. And after seven months, she was restored back to job. During this time, she went through some tough situations with which we as pastors helped her, particular sister Bina helped her, counseling and get, get her uh, those things done. She was set free. She got back to the job. And after one month, she got her salary. And then she goes to the exchange and sends through uh, Western Union in my name. The whole salary. I saw the amount. It's a whole salary. This is whole salary. I called her immediately. Baby, why did she do? She needs money. I, I mean, I was a little bit worried. I don't know why. I should have just said, oh, she has done. No. I called. You send the whole money. This is not your first fruit. This is not your first salary of a job. It's just you're restored to job. That's right. And she said, when I got, I settled in my heart. I want to give this to the Lord. I said, if you have done that, I shut my mouth. Do it. The Lord will bless you. What you have done. You know. Brothers and sisters, one more thing. When it comes to giving, let me talk to you. Some of you, I do not know if there's someone who will want to take this. Some of you, we, we just generally give this, you know, uh, uh, announcement. Take your tithes and keep it. Call us or send a message. They will collect it. I do get calls before we announce this. Some of them, our tithes are ready, Pastor. Can we? Give it who will come and collect. We organize that. That's number one. There are people after announcement, yes, pastor, our tithes are ready. Some people, before, they'll call in the beginning, our tithes are ready, please take it. Some call after we're standing, our tithes are ready. And some of you are taking time to come to church here in this place and bring your tithes and offerings because you know you want to give it to the Lord. And some of, some of us, no, they do not call me, but they call somebody whom we have authorized already and they know particular, that particular area, they're giving tithes. But yet, some I do not see, neither by call or by information. Maybe you, you found a way to send your tithes. Maybe, maybe you found it. I do not know. But what I want to tell you is, this sister went all the way to the Western Union and sends it again, and sends her tithes also, even before she did. Because she's not able to come to the church, she doesn't keep it. When I go, I will give it. When time comes, I will give it. When it comes to your offerings and tithes, rush to give it to the Lord. It's important. Rush to give it to the Lord. Don't hold what belongs to the Lord as quickly as you can. Collect them all and rush and give it to the Lord. Because you have to release it to the Lord. Then your blessing will come. And then I'll close this with scripture. So this sister, okay, let me finish this testimony. This sister gave this whole salary. I don't know what she ate the whole month. And the next month, she gets a promotion. She sends me this message. 
I am not eligible for this promotion because I'm not qualified for this promotion. I don't know. They did not ask me, dock me, and call me. Straight away, they send a circular to the whole department that this she has been promoted to this position. Hallelujah. You want blessings? You want to get something from the Lord? It's there are principles. If you apply those principles, uh, brothers and sisters, things will happen to you in your life. It will happen. I know myself. I don't want to tell my testimony. Today I've told many times how God changed in my entire life when I started tithing. Nobody taught me. No preacher told me. Thank God for the Spirit of the Lord, even though that time I was not baptized in the Spirit, but the Spirit of God was working in me. And how God changed my entire life, even till today. The principles work to redeem your promise. You have to bring. What does, what does the word say? Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Give, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Give. This is a principle. I want to tell you, when God's principle means, even a heathen man, when he gives, he gets. Whether he's an atheist, a believer, another God, another faith, doesn't matter. Anyone who gives, he gets back. This is the way the Lord operates. Everything is principles. It does not matter. You are a good man, bad man. If you are a giver, you receive. You giver, receive. I'm, one of my best examples is uh, Viju's, Sister Viju's father. He was an atheist all his life, but he was such a giver, such a giver for any poor people. He would just take care of him. He went, when he slept, he received Jesus Christ, of course, at the end, as a savior. He had, he lacked nothing. There were times he went through financial difficulties, but not lacked anything because he was a giver. Brothers and sisters, today, the principles of redemption I shared. I want to share one more part of this, probably covering the tithes and how to redeem your finances and so on. Uh, I want to do that because many of you, many of our church members are suffering with financial sufferings and sometimes sicknesses. You need to redeem it. You need to redeem it. You have to prepare yourself. Because without redeeming, your promises will not come to pass in your life. You have to take a drastic decision, sir. You have to take a radical decisions. When you are a giver, be a radical giver. See how God answers you back. He will answer. He cannot go out of his principles. When you are radically given, you will radically receive things that you cannot imagine, think, or ask. That is our God. This morning, if you want to make a solid, a concrete decision, I want to redeem my promise of this year. Not only this promise, I want to get everything God has for me. In my giving, my sacrifice of praise and worship I'll bring. I will sacrifice things. I'll sacrifice that costs me. That I sacrifice that's valuable to me. I'll give it to the Lord to receive my blessings. Some people keep on losing their jobs. Some people, you know, have financial problems. We have to look back and see if you have given things rightly to God. Hallelujah. Take this few minutes. You can play the music a little bit. Take this music. Take this thing in your heart. Question yourself. Are you being attacked on your health constantly? Going through difficult times financially? A job, you're threatened with your job, losing job. Check if you're tithing properly, giving God what you, it deserve, God deserves from you. What belongs to God if you do not give? I somewhere heard, he says, I will take it back. What belongs to, I'll surely get it from you. God will take what belongs to him. Without him taking your rest of the money cannot be sanctified. Take this strong decision. You have been not tithing for some time. Think about it. I want to talk about tithes, the principles of tithing sometime later. Maybe next time when I talk. But to get the promise, you need to redeem it by giving something to the Lord. The primary thing is praising, worshipping, honoring Him.
thanking Him for the promise every single day in your life. Remember, meditate upon the promise. Thank Him. Exalt Him. Secondly, offer Him something. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father God. Let's sing something else.
some of you have taken serious decision in your life to honor God with your first fruits, possessions, offerings to redeem the promises God has given to you. Not only just the promise for this year, but all the promises that are in the word of God. Hallelujah. God will answer you. God will bless you. Father, we thank you for your mercy. Thank you for this word. Continue to be glorified, O oh Father God, in our lives. And this promises me. We're redeemed by your children, by faith and trust in you. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' most precious name, pray, Lord. Amen, amen, amen.